HVAC Refrigeration Heat Load Calculations, HET 191, Week 8, Selecting Heating and Cooling Equipment. This objective for this week's uh, assignment will help the uh, HVAC learner to be able to develop appreciation for the importance of the Manual J, understand the different types of issues that can affect heat loads, analyze the construction of a home and determine the types of heat losses, use church tables and forms to calculate the heat loss of a home, locate manufacturer's data sheets and information sheets to choose the proper type of equipment, choose the type of equipment and determine the CFMs required. In the HVAC field, we have to be able to uh, look at prints and, and be able to choose equipment to determine what type of equipment is going to be installed and how well in the comfort level the house will be. So uh, after our HVAC technician has determined the heat capacity of a structure, the technician must consider uh, many other factors to do a uh, suitable job for the customer. Uh, so factors such as the location, the type of fuel available, uh, the duct layout, uh, and the amount of airflow through the home will uh, become vital for a complete and competent job. Comfort system business is what the business we are in. Uh, have to be able to depend on uh, the system, be able to work correctly at all times, and be able to uh, function. So uh, contractors, installers, and service personnel must first uh, work with the customer to establish realistic expectations and second install a system that performs to those expectations. Some of the terms, terms we want to discuss this week, um, not many, but we're going to talk about input capacity, output capacity, and the duct system. So one of the first things we would do is to interview the customer and to find out what they need. So some of the things we're looking at, what temperature they consider comfortable or humidity level, um, what things they can be putting in the house that may affect how the house is going to uh, be controlled by the temperature and humidity, such as how many people are going to be in the house, what type of plants or have a lot of plants or animals, things like that. So these concerns are very important because uh, if the humidity is going to be high, mold and mildew and other type things can be a, a major issue and cause a health issues in, with the people that are going to be occupying it. Also, we need to understand uh, the different building codes based on the, the area or the, um, or the region or municipalities that uh, can have special rules governing uh, how houses should be built and the things that will go inside of the house, such as the mechanical systems. The system, um, really the, the capability of a um, house and how it's going to deliver um, the air and the heat and cooling for that. So um, things like number of zones or the speed, or it could be a multiple speed or variable speed, uh, things that we will look at and help choose some of the equipment that will go into the house. Um, so a lot of times just interviewing the customer you can help you lead into those areas where we can make a determination and make a suggestions to the customer to allow them to, um, to help pick the type of equipment that would be suitable to them. So some of the benefits of a detailed and accurate load calculations and things that we, we uh, look at is something we call the smallest defensible load uh, approach to equipment sizing to optimize the uh, the system performance and maximizing the customer satisfaction. So here's some of the things we'll look at. It's a list of things providing specific comfort and humidity controls at the design conditions, provide acceptable uh, comfort and humidity controls at a partial load conditions, provide reasonable comfort at, at outdoor design conditions, and reduce the possibility of indoor mold and mildew uh, by removing humidity uh, when it's high. And there's other things that we need to keep in mind of, like even the energy costs for the, um, the, the house. By knowing that uh, certain pieces of equipment can be um, more efficient than others can be suggested to the, to the customer. Here's some other benefits that we have. Um, if it's sizing it for the right size, um, 
oversizing equipment is never good, or undersizing is never good, but coming up with the right size to determine um, the, the heat load, but of, co of course will save cost in uh, operating the system too. So this is a list of many different things that we have to consider and look at to be able to determine um, that the house is going to work correctly. So if it's don't do this, that's when lawsuits and comes up and uh, dissatisfied customers or a b bad name for the company. So keep in mind that if we do our work, our due diligence, we will have uh, less issues and problems as we go forward. So this is a list of some of the things that we need to consider. Here's other consequences. Increase insulation operating costs. Impose unnecessary loads on utility grids. Um, produce uh, price quotes uh, that are less competent than or competitive than uh, other quotes. And a lot of times we can underbid a job and put the smaller pieces of equipment in, and then the customers happy about the price, but they're dissatisfied with the operation of, of the equipment. So some of the business issues that we run into. Um, a successful business really set themselves apart from other business based on taking the time to look at price and how the serviceability of the equipment and how dependable or even the installation the things that we will look at too so um, looking at all these factors can set one business apart from another business so in that case we need to uh, consider these things. So uh, interviewing the customers and going through all the issues that can affect how um, the business will, the HVAC business will um, satisfy the customer needs um, is looking at not only just a few things but almost everything that possibly can uh, come in uh, contact with the uh, with issues or problems if it's not done correctly. So that's why we look at, use these different manuals to help keep us straight. The manual J is just one to help do heat loads, but there's uh, multiple other manuals that we can use to give us a little more clarity of how to do uh, the best job possible, like the manual RS or manual S, manual D, um, or manual T. These are going to sizing up ductwork or sizing equipment, looking at factors that can uh, play in um, to cause us to do a better job for our clients. So, as we go through and we do a survey by interviewing the customer, <coughs> your survey uh, system design calculations and reports demonstrate that your price is competitive because the smaller equipment has been justified by an accurate load estimate. Money spent on the design work is, is far better investment than money spent on uh, excess capacity or taking care of problems in the future. You are providing a value-added service and not just selling uh, boxes or just selling the, the pieces of equipment. You have uh, you can be trusted by uh, other customers by the word of mouth and the reason why you care. So here's a checklist that you find. This is just an excerpt from the uh, Manual J and it goes some of the things that you need to go through. This is a close-up picture of it but it's in our, our book and this second page of it or actually the bottom portion of it and this is just a list of things that we'll find. It's in section one um, and this is just a blow up of that page looking at uh, heating and cooling loads and things that we need to consider. So loads are determined by of course the region where you're located, so the local weather patterns, building materials, construction techniques, types of appliances, building orientation, and other number of occupants in the house. 
these loads and other loads imposed by the HVAC system components, such as the ductwork, actually where it's located, if in the attic, where it's in the house, or is in conditioned space or non-conditioned space, uh, the type of blower you have. All these are factors that we will look at. Uh, I was looking at the building itself, the building envelope, and how the building is put together. And, of course, we discussed that over the past few weeks, but it is stri st strictly important to look at because once we determine the heat load, then we need to choose the equipment to be able to deliver uh, that capacity that we need. So if we look at this picture, this is from the Manual J, and we notice that all these are different areas that can affect how the, um, the heat will be transferred through the building. Now, for example, you look in the attic, they got uh, in the attic there's a space there, a cavity where you can put duct work, but of course if the duct up there, we can lose heat or gain heat. Um, that which the equipment have to be sized larger to be able to uh, compensate for the losses or gains. Here's a list of other issues that we look at for sensible loads and latent loads that we talked about before, but this is the uh, fenestration and uh, opaque structure panels and how it produced sensible heat loads, but of course latent heat loads is the air through infiltration coming in from outdoors or the people inside of the building or plants or animals that may be inside of the, the building. Here's solar gains and we're talking about how things can be affected and we look at other things that can affect it, the sunlight coming through the windows, the people inside of the structure, appliances like washing machines and dryers that which can add a heat load uh, or humidity into the house. This is looking at um, design loads and other conditions that we will deal with and <clears throat> as we look at the uh, sizing up the equipment and so forth. Um, so we just go through, and this is from the Manual J again. So the dwellings are subject to design load conditions, uh, part load conditions, and extreme load conditions. And all these are based on uh, design conditions. And of course, we look at the different tables to determine how that, that is done. A partial load operation is a critical comfort issue because part load conditions uh, occurs most of the, uh, the time. Uh, <coughs> we talk about the amount of time uh, per year. Extreme load conditions are not uh, investigated because on a average they occur only for a few dozen hours per year. Extreme loads, like for example, uh, uh, may have a summer that is not a normal summer and maybe for three or four days out of that summer it, the temperature got well above a hundred degrees even though the design outdoor temperature was 95 we don't design systems for those extreme loads but usually the part loads or the normal design conditions that we find so these loads are um, sometimes like can affect it of course the equipment can be sized that it might be working equipment harder than normal but uh, that is considered uh, one of the things that we have to look at because if we oversize or undersize equipment based on certain loads uh, the customer will not be happy and that's when issues and problems are to come room loads are determined uh, the values of supply CFMs. So once we determine the block loads, the block loads is the whole structure, then we need to look at each separate room individually. And these individual loads for the room uh, will determine how much air we go or how much air is required for these different ro rooms. So that way we, then we can know how to size up the ductwork. So once we determine block loads, then we will go to the individual room loads. So system loads are HVC systems may produce its own set of loads, such as ductwork um, that going through um, unconditioned space, or there's other things inside of equipment inside of the house or that can add additional type of heat loads. So that 
is need to be considered and of course certain rooms may have those loads and because of that it may change the heat load in the room so these duct loads are necessary so duct loads are used to determine the amount of energy that is either absorbed into the duct systems from outside sources and because of that uh, we need to uh, consider those losses or gains um, based on the um, condition spaces. So in the manual J and we look at this figure and we could uh, this table and we see that um, how we can look at different types of duct work and and where it's located and some of the things that we need to consider as we go through and like I said this is found in the manual J manual so duct loads there are there are no uh, duct loads when ducts are installed within the condition space because it is the same temperature as the environment around it However, when it's in uh, unconditioned space, we need to consider those temperatures. So when ducts are installed in unconditioned spaces, they will add to the sensible load, um, such as ductwork in the attic or in a crawl space in the summertime, uh, because those temperatures are going to be higher than the, uh, the room temperatures. So the manual J provides low factors for various types of duct locations, configurations, uh, duct wall R values, if it's uh, coated with uh, insulation or either outside or inside the ductwork. So um, if the dwelling duct system is not compatible uh, with those listed in figure 1-1 one uh, which is used in the underbridge edition um, that we can um, look at these scenarios differently and be able to um, find something closer to what we need. Here's a few uh, different tables that we can look at these factors to help uh, compensate for uh, these heat uh, gains and losses. Here's a closer look at the tables. Another close look at the tables again. And looking at the default wall surface area. And then, of course, we need to have a blueprint or write down the size of the duct to come up with this amount of uh, heat transfer. And again, looking at this, a closer look at it. So duct loads, Manuel J recommends uh, significant uh, amounts of wall insulation for duct runs in unconditioned space. Of course, if we don't do that, we will um, gain a great deal of heat energy because if the ductwork is in an attic which can be 130 degrees and having a room temperature of 75 degrees we can see that we are gaining a great deal of heat energy and we have to oversize the air conditioning system to be able to compensate for those uh, gains. So sealing the ducts up and other things like that is factors that we need to look at too. So these days we will use some type of mastic to um, go around any type of joints to keep from losing air or, or, or absorbing air if it's on the return side of the system. So we're looking at table 7 and uses to provide a surface and area adjustments for situations when exposed surface uh, areas of actual ducts are not uh, the same appropriate, uh, appropriate sizes or surface areas as the default system. And so, but in a way, we look at, um, for example, a six inch round duct, 100 feet long, has a surface area of, we look at the perimeter, C equals the pi times the, uh, the focus. So as we look at this, um, the six inch round duct, 100 feet long, it said it has a uh, surface area of, so basically we will go through, use the, the formula of its circumference, then multiply times its uh, length, and that will give you the total number of uh, square feet of the, of the duct. So the duct system 
leakage to uh, and from the uh, unconditioned space can cause the pressure in the uh, conditioned space to uh, to be higher or lower than the outdoor ambient temperature and because so as we look at the air leakages um, things we have to consider uh, when we run duct work through um, non conditioned space they should seal up all the joints to keep from having leakages um, going into the uh, those areas of course if it's a return duct we have infiltration going into it and if it's a supplied duct we would have exfiltration air leaving the duct work here example of a picture you can see that in this picture um, the return duct and it's pulling air in and of course it's negative pressure and because of the negative pressure we can any type of um, uh, openings in, uh, in the joints can cause air to be mixed in and be pulled into the um, into the ductwork. Of course if we do that we're going to have to either heat or cool that air uh, compensate for the, the heat load that is uh, built from the infiltration. Some of the things that we have to look at, like this flex duct that is have a start collar on it and it's not connected very well, and because it's um, has um, openings in it, it definitely will have issues of losing air out if it's on the supply side. So let's look at some of the um, things to consider when we're looking at ductwork, either in the attic or in a crawl space, and how it can change. The, the volume of air throughout the house because uh, from having a system that's not totally sealed we can um, gain and lose um, some of the volume of air plus not only that the heat transfer through the, the not conditioned space can cause the, uh, the system to work harder trying to make up for those differences and look at the same example going next up to about leakages into the returns so we look at the um, a ventilation system and how we need to apply that to a house. Um, when we have like kitchen fans, bathroom fans, that is actually drawing air out the house, we need to replenish the, that amount of air and um, through other means. Uh, if we can control it somehow by having a ventilation system, we can control that to a certain point uh, because if the house is tight and we bring mechanically bring air into the house, we can um, control uh, the amount of uh, infiltration, exfiltration based on when the temperature is, is extreme and to make the house more efficient that way. So we have to have a house with some air changes and cannot be extremely tight uh, so you have to have some uh, ventilation but if the more you, you consider controlling the mechan by mechanical means uh, the more efficient the house will become. Here's an example how we do that, where we could bring uh, air in through, through a duct that is outdoors, uh, have a, a grill to filter out any uh, debris, but it run it into the return duct, and through that uh, uh, course, we can actually uh, make the house uh, uh, normally have a controlled amount of uh, air changes. A couple things we also have to look at when we're looking at uh, latent loads is the humidification that we actually have to add to the house in the um, in the winter time and these loads of course the higher the humidity it will help with uh, the heat load but not going too high because it can cause damage to the structure through a condensation forming on windows and dripping or uh, having um, moisture get trapped into dry walls and cold areas and cause in uh, mold to grow but controlling the humidity uh, is, is, is very important year-round even in the summertime so the summertime we actually have to remove humidity because when the humidity inside the building goes above 50 percent have a, a tendency to uh, have mold and other uh, bacteria to grow and have issues with uh, issues so latent loads we have to consider People may have uh, plants or animals or fish tanks and or uh, let's say um, uh, jacuzzis inside of the house. 
and which adding additional amounts of uh, latent heat and so we have to consider those and, and, and be able to determine that um, to help uh, keep those levels in a safe level. So as we look at this we know that um, when we have a uh, heat load from uh, other type loads, sensible heat loads, but uh, from other things that we may not consider, but it's still there, such as even a blower. Uh, a blower, because of velocity and the heat from the uh, motor operating, can generate a certain amount of heat energy that we need to consider also. It's not that large of a load, but it can make a, a, a difference with other smaller loads, can uh, affect how the cooling uh, in the summertime will need to be sized for the system. So considering these loads even from blowers is extremely important. So induced uh, infiltration loads is um, the things that we uh, look at uh, in the manual J we talk about these uh, infiltration of course, in, of course inf infiltration is air that is coming from outside to inside of the structure um, and a lot of times it's from things like just like I was mentioning earlier about leaky ducts. Uh, if it's not uh, sealed and not using mastics to uh, close up the any joints and things like that, uh, we can pull uh, uh, air into the house if it's in not, con not conditioned space, such as in a crawl space where the humidity can be pretty high sometime uh, in crawl spaces. And because of that, we bring air in, but air that is latent with moisture. So, once you determine the total uh, heat load of the house, then we need to size up the equipment. And that's where we go into looking uh, for the equipment as close to that uh, block load of the house. As we look at the, the loads, we will find both the heating and cooling equipment to match as close as possible uh, to these needs. And if we go through uh, the manual J and look at uh, the tables and as we look at the uh, the loads go down on that uh, table we find on the uh, the totals where on line 20 it was the total sensible uh, loss and or gain and that will give us both under heating or cooling under block loads the the uh, the size of the equipment and of course we try to go as close as to that number as possible without going under that load. Uh, so that is what is required based on the design outdoor indoor temperatures. Here's a closer look at that. You can see at the very bottom line 20 again and we could determine that uh, amount of uh, BTUs uh, based on um, that structure of the house. Of course, we look at these loads again, and as we saw earlier, that these are areas that we need to consider as we go through and size up the, the structure. So one of the things we need to do is actually locate where the furnace is going to go, or the air conditioning system, and how they're going to affect the, the duct runs in the house. So even though we, we know the size of the equipment, the location in the house is also one of the uh, considerations that we must consider. And there we go again with people, locations, uh, the, the most um, advantageous area to locate the, um, the ductwork. So we look at the, uh, the equipment. There's two numbers that we will have, the output and input. And the input is the amount of energy that the equipment is, is consuming but the output is actually the usable amount of energy that um, the house need to um, to heat or cool it. So we will go by, we size our equipment by the output data. So as we go through and prepare these forms and we go through step by step by using these worksheets and we talked last week about these worksheets, uh, but to get the total loads, we have to start 
um, at the beginning, like with worksheet A, which is really just putting the design conditions together as we do a survey with the customer and to determine some of the things they're looking for. Then we use the, the other worksheets to work through each component of the, uh, the house. And as we work through each one of these components, we're gathering information to fill in for the main sheet. And once we get that, now we can go from room to room. So, therefore, the survey is important as we go through, because if you do an accurate survey, this will help you to put the um, as most the closest uh, estimate of um, of the materials been used and the sizes and things like that to get as close to um, the accurate numbers for the house. And if you take your time and work through these steps by using worksheets so you don't forget anything, uh, you have a better chance to, uh, to have uh, a structure or mechanical system designed for the customer that they would be happy with it because of the comfort level they would be able to gain from uh, the, the design that you came up with. So there are some protocols we have to consider as we go through these um, the steps and it was a nice thing about the manual J the first part of the of the, of the manual J really walk you through each one of these sections and to give you clarity of it then once you get to section 6 in the in manual J it goes through step by step how to fill out the sheets and if you follow the steps that way uh, you have a better chance not to miss anything and so there's things that you, you have to uh, be accurate with like there's some mandatory requirements that you cannot um, um, forget about or or uh, that you cannot um, uh, make a mistakes on because that can affect everything else which you design so for example like the design outdoor temperature indoor temperature um, can um, be a great deal because we're looking at certain TDs and the materials not going to change but of course the TDs outdoors uh, from indoor-outdoor will affect how much load that you're going to uh, determine for the structure.